Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, very uh, nice event and uh, to uh, present uh, some uh, reflections uh, in front of uh, a very expert uh, audience. Uh, I must say that uh, this uh, presentation is a little like an advertisement for, uh, for a book, uh, which uh, will be out in a few uh, months, before the end of the year, as a matter of fact, which is uh, the Handbook of uh, Income Distribution, volume number two. And in order to understand the title of this presentation and uh, the uh, uh, when which uh, these uh, 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 thoughts uh, are uh, being uh, put together, I think it is interesting to go back to uh, the uh, genesis of this uh, handbook of income distribution, volume number two. Uh, Fifteen years ago, with uh, Tony Atkinson, we edited this uh, handbook of income distribution at uh, Elsevier. In those days, uh, we cannot say that uh, income distribution was really in the mainstream. Uh, we well, uh, all felt, felt like uh, uh, on, on the side of uh, the main uh, economic uh, uh, areas. And uh, we made a huge effort to uh, put together uh, many very good contributors and to make sure that uh, we were able to give a rather comprehensive picture of what uh, income distribution analysis was about and uh, what we knew and what we didn't know in those days. Because of that, we were very surprised when uh, the book came out to see that the publisher had added to the title Handbook of Income Distribution, volume number one. We immediately said that there will be no volume number two. We, we've said we put together all what we could. Uh, there is nothing left. Uh, and that was it. Then, uh, three years ago, we... Uh, the directors of that collection, Ken Arrow and uh, uh, Michael and Tuligator, uh, asking us whether we would uh, consider doing a volume number two. They said, no, look, I mean, there is no way we can make a volume number two. And moreover, uh, a few years before, another uh, uh, Oxford uh, uh, handbook on economic inequality had uh, been uh, published. So we thought that there was nothing to add to, 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 to all this. And one day with Tony, we were having a dinner together uh, in a nice uh, restaurant in Paris. And we said, okay, if we had to do that, what would be uh, the chapters of this uh, new handbook? And we started brainstorming. And very quickly, on the, uh, on the napkin of the restaurant, we were able to have 20 chapters, uh, which we thought were really quite interesting, and we had not realized that things had gone so quickly and that so much uh, knowledge had been accumulated uh, during those uh, 10 years in those days, now uh, 15 years. So this is the reason why finally we decided to move on and to have another handbook on top of the Oxford one, on top of the first one, and not only to have another handbook, but to have a handbook with two volumes. It will be number 2A and number 2B. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the table of contents of 2A. I will not go through all the chapters. Uh, you see that it is very, very uh, 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 comprehensive. We have four parts, concepts and approaches, evidence, uh, uh, theory in uh, 2B, uh, and uh, finally uh, policy. And uh, this presentation basically is, uh, 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 relies on uh, the introductory chapter that we are just finishing with, uh, uh, with Tony. And in that uh, introductory chapter, we are trying to give a flavor of uh, the issues which are uh, being uh, discussed uh, throughout the handbook. But this is a very long one, so, and this is a short chapter, so it is really a very, very uh, 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 impressionistic uh, uh, view to uh, all this and we are trying to add some personal reflections on the state of uh, this, uh, this field. And this is what I will be uh, presenting. Uh, I will 
take uh, uh, up the various uh, parts of the handbook, in some cases very, very quickly, because these are issues which are discussed later on uh, in this uh, conference, so uh, there would be some redundancy in uh, uh, dealing with, the, with uh, these issues extensively. Okay, so let me start with this uh, first uh, uh, part, which is on the different facets of uh, inequality, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, tell you more or less what uh, uh, we think and uh, what uh, the handbook tries to, to achieve. The uh, first uh, aspect of uh, uh, this uh, uh, diversity of inequality, and again, and I believe this is a real progress that we made over the last uh, 15 years, the fact that today when we look at inequality, we are immediately convinced that there are various ways we can do that. We can consider different definitions of income. We can look at, we can look at family income. We can look at individual earnings. We can look at uh, wealth. And we know that uh, what we will be concluding from a descriptive analysis might not be the same in the various cases. What you have on this picture is various uh, uh, inequality uh, uh, measures corresponding to different concepts of inequality in the case of the U.S. And in the case of the U.S., you have some parallel uh, evolutions, basically because we are in a very favorable case where inequality has increased so much in uh, the U.S. that all the definitions are more or less consistent in showing this increase in inequality. But this view that uh, we have to look at those various aspects, not only the type of income or the kind of income concept that we use, but also to look at the unit, whether we are looking at individuals, at individuals within families, as with uh, intra-household inequality, uh, uh, as uh, when we look at gender inequality, this kind of thing, whether we are looking at uh, uh, groups of uh, people, we know that the uh, uh, con conclusions that we will get from descriptive analysis will not be the same. Where, where there will be differences depending on the kind of source of uh, data source that we are using. Uh, already in this morning, we heard about the difference between uh, tax data and uh, uh, surveys. Uh, indeed, in some cases, we find different uh, uh, evolutions depending on the source that we are looking for, that we are looking at. And the main conclusion from that is that the progress that we have made is that we are now convinced that we have to take uh, the whole, uh, to look at the whole picture rather than to look at only one. Uh, of these uh, curves. Uh, I would say that 15 years ago, too many people would have been happy looking at me at one of those curves. And uh, if you look at the case of uh, the US and find that, as I said before, there is consistency between the Gini of uh, gross incomes, uh, family income, uh, between uh, the top 1% uh, in uh, coming from the tax data, uh, from the wealth distribution. But if you look at all those curves, you'll see that there is a curve which has a completely different pattern, which is increasing right since 1950, which is inequality of individual earnings. And uh, uh, this is a curve which is more, at the end, it uh, goes to uh, uh, the middle of uh, the, the, the chart. And uh, uh, here we can see that there is, uh, even in the case of the U.S., uh, depending on what we're looking at, there are differences. And what we like to do is we need to look to see what is the kind of relationship that we have between those various concepts. So this is, I think, one dimension of the progress made over, over the last 15 years. Another progress has to do with the fact that we moved toward another definition of uh, uh, inequality, which is what we called in uh, this uh, chapter with uh, uh, Tony, beyond income inequality. And we're using beyond income in, in the same analogy as uh, beyond GDP, as uh, was uh, mentioned in the morning by Marcelo, the, the work by Sen, Stiglitz, and uh, Fitoussi. And uh, the uh, idea behind that goes back to uh, almost the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, current uh, 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 
uh, episode of uh, in, in, inequality measurement uh, when uh, Rawls and Sen uh, basically has a question about uh, uh, equality of what? I mean, this was a Sen's question, very well-known Sen's question, but uh, uh, 50 years ago almost, uh, uh, Sen has a question of, uh, already uh, uh, got the intuition that looking only at monetary inequality and income was uh, not enough. And since then, there's been a lot of activity going on, and it's quite interesting to see that it is only on, in the last 15 years, more or less, that a huge uh, emphasis has been put on this aspect of inequality. And uh, in the handbook, we have not, least, not less than four chapters dealing with these issues. And uh, I think it is interesting to, to uh, show you uh, the kind of uh, uh, evolution thought evolution behind uh, this, and uh, we try to put together a kind of a simple framework which shows uh, the different uh, concepts which are used by people and the way in which they are trying to quantify beyond income inequality. And I will simply uh, look at uh, this uh, uh, very uh, simple uh, list of, uh, of concepts. At the beginning, we can use the uh, sense uh, uh, concept of functionings, which is basically the way in which uh, people live. And in this vector of functionings, A uh, sub i for individual i, we can make a distinction between income, which is y, and the non-income dimensions. So y would be uh, income or consumption expenditures, and the x would be uh, health, would be uh, the relationship with uh, uh, your neighbors or with your family. Uh, it uh, would be uh, the kind of uh, job status uh, in a society that uh, you have, etc. Uh, and uh, we can work with that and say, okay, what is the inequality of functionings? And uh, what we call multidimensional inequality measurement basically is about this. And of course, there is a chapter, and the author of the chapter is in the, the room. Uh, one of the authors is in the room about, about this. But you can say, okay, the way in which we can uh, do that, uh, the way we go from multidimensional concept to inequality, we have to go back to one dimension. So the way in which this is done, that people are using an aggregator function, which put together the y and the x into a single scalar, and then inequality is measured on this single scalar. And there are many, many ways we can do that, and of course, for every aggregator function, we'll have a different way of measuring inequality, and a lot of uh, uh, things have been written on this. Now, this aggregator function is very arbitrary, and uh, presumably you would like to be able to use uh, the fact that people are different in their preferences among all possible functionings. And this is a second uh, concept, individual preferences among all the functionings, which depends on the individual. And the issue is, is it possible to take into account these individual preferences? And one approach is the one which has been proposed by uh, Marc Florbet and uh, François Maniquet and uh, Comte de Canck, uh, which is to use uh, income equivalent approach using these uh, 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 individual utility functions and estimating utility f uh, individual utility functions on uh, satisfaction uh, uh, data. The third concept is again a very, very timely concept because it goes from preferences or ordinal utility to cardinal utility. Then S is for satisfaction, and the satisfaction comes from the utility that uh, people get from the uh, set of functions that they have, plus a, uh, individual characteristics which explain why people with the same functionings may enjoy a different level of satisfaction. And people, some people, instead of looking at income, instead of looking at uh, health, uh, uh, or the other non-income dimensions of uh, welfare or functionings would be looking at satisfaction. And many people have tried to look at the way in which the inequality in satisfaction is changing over time and across countries. 
which raises some technical issues because satisfaction is not continuous. It is a categorical variable, but I don't insist on this. And then if we move up in the degree of generality of the concept, then we have the inequality of capabilities. And what is a capability? Capability is a set in which people can choose the functioning. And this set, Q, depends on some individual trait, individual context parameter. And the issue would be to measure the inequality of those sets. This is something that we don't know very well how to do. Uh, this is technically extremely difficult. So many people, instead of doing that, simply look at the inequality in the individual parameters Z. And when you look at the Human Development Index, for example, this is what uh, this uh, corresponds to, and then some people have uh, tried to generalize that uh, uh, using uh, individual data and uh, coming from, from surveys. And in the same line, we have people who are trying to measure inequality of opportunities. And the way to do that is to define types of people using the ZI, and then to look at the way in which, for various types of uh, uh, people, the distributions of the functionings uh, where are changing or not, uh, or uh, the differences in distributions of the functionings across different types. This shows you the elaboration, the conceptual elaboration of this non uh, beyond income inequality uh, school and uh, again there is a huge activity in this area and uh, uh, for the moment uh, I don't think that uh, we have uh, found uh, simple uh, ways. I mean, there are some partial results which are interesting, in particular uh, all those results on uh, multidimensional poverty uh, uh, with uh, depriv deprivation counting, uh, but uh, uh, there are still uh, efforts to be made, and this is definitely, apparently, a very important uh, uh, area of research in, in, in this whole field. I go over this because it's where the detail of what I just said. On the data, uh, I will not say more, uh, very much, simply to uh, say that there are three areas of uh, progress, three avenues of progress. One is that uh, over the last 15 years, we have this uh, rise in experimental economics. And uh, in the field of income distribution, we are using actual uh, uh, statistics on income, but uh, in experimental economics, uh, uh, economists are generating their data to some extent and are trying to see how people feel, how people behave uh, uh, with, uh, uh, in the front of some specific situations. And this is really uh, providing a wealth of uh, new data, and this is certainly something that will be going on now for uh, quite some time. Administrative data, and in particular the top income uh, 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 source coming from tax data, is something which is more and more widely used, and it is certainly something which has to be uh, recommended uh, uh, when it is possible to do that. And finally, a very important progress has been historical data. This is follows Piketty's uh, 2001 book on uh, uh, tax data in France. Uh, now this has been applied to uh, many countries. And this means that uh, in many cases uh, you are able to look at the evolution of wealth inequality, in some cases income inequality, going back one uh, century for income, uh, going back two centuries at least for uh, wealth uh, uh, inequality. In uh, the uh, handbook, there is a chapter which is uh, focusing on this, and it is really quite impressive to see uh, the kind of uh, data and the kind of information that researchers have been able to, to, dig, uh, to dig out. And, the fine, and obviously, the big uh, progress is the increasing availability of uh, income and consumption surveys, uh, but uh, there are still uh, compar comparability problems uh, across countries across uh, uh, time periods, and uh, because this is something that will be discussed in the afternoon with this uh, Journal of Economic Inequality uh, panel, I'm not insisting on this. Let me say a few words. Uh, I, would I would have liked to say a few words on uh, uh, economic theory. Uh, 
But let me simply say what I wanted to, uh, what, the, what was the message I wanted to deliver. Uh, economic theory uh, is, uh, there's a lot of uh, activity going on in income distribution analysis through theoretical models. At the same time, uh, there is a lot of research being done on uh, uh, empirical data. But the link between those two research uh, uh, streams is not completely clear. Very often, empirical uh, uh, data analysts are uh, using theory in a very, very simple, uh, almost naive way. And in many cases, uh, theorists are satisfied with very general results, which uh, may not be uh, that relevant when looking at data. And uh, to some extent, there is, in some cases, too little theory, and in some other cases, too much theory and not enough empirical analysis. And what uh, <coughs> we're trying to do in this uh, interim chapter is to give examples of that. So one example is really about the role. I mean, this is something which has been discussed again and again. What is the uh, uh, role of skilled bias technical progress in the increase in earnings inequality that we observed in many countries in the world? Uh, and we're trying to show that uh, most empirical analyses are very, very short on the theoretical uh, 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 stay on the theoretical level, and because of that, uh, the kind of conclusion that they get uh, is not really completely uh, satisfactory. Uh, I would like to spend some minutes on the second example, which is automation, because I believe that this is giving a very uh, nice uh, uh, view about uh, what uh, we, we, we can do. And then I will not say very much about uh, the disregard of transitional paths. Theorists uh, tend to look at steady states. And uh, the problem is that uh, we know that in the real world, to go from one steady state to another steady state may take in some cases, 40, 50 years. If you look at the Piketty book and uh, this distribution of wealth and this idea that when R minus G is uh, increasing, there will be more inequality, uh, yes, at the steady state, but uh, because this is an intergenerational model, to get to the steady state of an intergenerational model, you may need one century. So in one century, many other things may change. And uh, the kind of relevance that uh, we uh, uh, get from this kind of political analysis in order to do policy analysis is not uh, completely clear. But because of time, I don't think I will uh, even talk about the second uh, uh, topic. I prepared something for a much longer presentation, I know, two minutes. So maybe you'll be missing uh, uh, the most uh, dramatic part, which was this one, where basically we are uh, uh, imagining what uh, the world will be in, uh, uh, in 50 years from now, maybe 40 years from now, uh, and uh, we are providing some possible hypothesis about what is going on and the reason why inequality is increasing and in particular the reason why the capital share in GDP is increasing. But let me conclude looking at uh, uh, the role of policies. Uh, in the field of policies, uh, again, over the last 15 years there has been a big change in the uh, policy context. In particular, when 15 years ago uh, income distribution, income inequality was not really in the forefront in policy debate. Today, there is a kind of official adoption of distributional objectives. The MDGs is probably the best example, but we just heard uh, somebody from the IMF talking about inequality and redistribution. This is something which would have been somewhat odd uh, 15 years ago. Uh, maybe uh, Andy will not, be, will not agree with that, but uh, uh, from, uh, uh, I've, I've been outside the IMF, but close to the IMF on the other side of the street, and this is really uh, the feeling that we had. Davos is talking about inequality. Amazing, okay? Obama, we know, has, uh, is about uh, maybe to launch a war on inequality. So this is something completely new. At the same time, and this is quite interesting, there is a kind of pessimism 
in developed countries about the potential to continue with the kind of redistribution system that we have and some pessimism about the possibility to go against the increase in inequality that we observe using the instruments that we have. And basically this is because globalization is making many of those instruments uh, uh, inefficient or ineffective. In particular, the tax system is becoming ineffective uh, because of uh, uh, the mobility of capital and, of course, the mobility, in some cases, the mobility of, uh, of, of, of people. And at the same time, we have what we heard this morning with Marcelo Neri's presentation, we have the decline in inequality, and that we will have be hearing more uh, today, uh, the decline in inequality in Latin America. And uh, so this is a, a very interesting change in the uh, landscape of income distribution policies in comparison with the situation uh, 15 years ago. Now, when we look at the future, I think that the future is quite right for developing countries. We have heard something of this type for this, this morning. Uh, economic analysis is definitely confirming the fact that uh, there has been a, a huge impact of policies in the Latin American case. And we know that because, and this was also something that Andy Berg said, because the redistribution system is very little developed in developing countries or in emerging countries, because of that there is a huge scope for uh, intervention in many of these countries. So from that point of view, the pessimism is uh, not really on the side of uh, developing countries. Uh, uh, and this is exactly the, 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 the opposite. But in developed countries, the fact that the, con the conventional uh, instruments, which will not uh, disappear, I mean, social security will, uh, uh, will uh, stay alive and the uh, uh, redistribution uh, benefits, uh, uh, tax and benefit systems will remain alive, this is not the issue. The point is that more inequality will be very difficult to fight with the instruments that we have in our hands. And because of that, it may be... Uh, uh, time to be uh, thinking outside the box and maybe to get back to, in some cases, old ideas uh, uh, about uh, uh, income distribution and uh, uh, income distribution policies, uh, which uh, may have been uh, forgotten. But uh, ideas like uh, basic income or uh, something that Atkinson uh, at some stage uh, called participation in, uh, income, things like uh, this whole idea by uh, Thomas Paine to uh, create a, a kind of universal inheritance. Everybody would be inheriting at uh, 20, uh, uh, 25 or 20 uh, some uh, amount of uh, capital. Uh, things of this type are probably uh, utopian were considered as utopias uh, at uh, some stage uh, if uh, indeed we are in a system where inequality will keep increasing and there are some reasons to believe that this will be the case, uh, then uh, it is uh, time to uh, look uh, maybe more carefully to uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, interventions. So uh, thinking outside the box is really quite important. Uh, some people are trying to do it in the handbook, uh, but uh, not enough. Uh, this means that uh, uh, new ideas are most wanted, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, 15 years from now there will be another handbook. I will be dead by that time, uh, but uh, a new handbook with truly uh, innovative ideas and outside-of-the-box ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.